Hello and welcome to the world of NDE 4.0. My name is Johannes Frana and today is a great day. Because today we'll get to a really important topic in the regards to ultrasonic testing. We'll get to the ultrasonic sound field. To the sound field emitted by an ultrasonic transducer, by an ultrasonic probe. Now, I know within the last video, the video on automated ultrasonic testing. I actually promised to do a video on the scanning grid next. Yeah, but actually I was in the process of recording that video on the scanning grid. And during recording it, it dawned on me, you need some information about the sound field to actually make a good video on the scanning grid. So here we go. Let's get on with the sound field. So, most likely you have seen within your level two, your level three courses, or in any documents you have seen, this picture of the sound field of an ultrasonic probe. What you can see here, you can see here, up here, this tiny red line, this is actually our active element, our transducer. That active element, emits a sound field and that sound field is actually yeah going through our component it's going from the top to the bottom that's our propagation direction of our sound field now what we can see we can see in the near field we can see some interference patterns then we are coming to a point where we have a maximum amplitude this is our natural focal point this is our near field distance. And for this probe, this is 45 millimeters. Now, you might say, okay, I wanna do some focusing, either by using a face to ray probe or by using some, yeah, some, some wedges. In that case, you can move your focal point actually closer to your probe but you can move it not further away. So that natural focal point, which is also called the near field distance, is actually, yeah, the furthest you can go with your focusing. You can always go shorter, but never longer. But that was just a side note. Now, within or everything before our natural focal point is called the near field or the Fresnel zone. Everything below, or beyond, it's called the far field, the Fraunhofer uh, zone. Within the far field, we will have a main lobe, and we have multiple side lobes. So, this is kind of the image you know from a lot of documentation. Let me point out one fact. Now, we have here an L wave transducer megahertz single element round with 24 millimeters diameter with a bandwidth of zero percent what does a bandwidth of zero percent mean that means we are emitting a wave with exactly two megahertz and only two megahertz so nothing at 1.9 megahertz and nothing at 2.1 megahertz if you look at the spectrum, this means, yeah, it's coming from zero megahertz, nothing, 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 nothing. Once we reach two megahertz, we get a peak. And after two megahertz, we have nothing. Now, if you look into any data sheet of any probe, or if you remember seeing some of those data sheets, you will remember that a bandwidth of zero percent or such a sharp peak for your spectrum is nothing you have ever seen on a real probe. A real probe actually has this spectrum. Yeah, you can still see we have a maximum at two megahertz, but it's not a sharp line going up and down here at two megahertz. It's kind of this hill. And normally what we are Stating as the bandwidth is the so-called 60B bandwidth. Let's have a look. At those 60B, we are here at about 1.5 megahertz. 
and up here we are at 2.6 megahertz. So we have a bandwidth of about 1.1 megahertz, which is equivalent to a bandwidth of 55%. So now let's look into how the sound field looks like if we take that bandwidth into account. I guess you can already see the difference, but let me flip back and forth for you a little bit. So 0%, 50%, 0%, 50%. So what are the main differences? The main differences are here in our near field. We do not see all those interference patterns. Those interference patterns you are used to see in some literature. So, yeah, I guess you can see my point. Also in the far field, in the far field, we only see a main lobe. We do not see any more any side lobes. So this picture, see in a lot of different places and which tell you oh be be aware you might get some reflections from some side lobes or near field might be tricky because you have all those interference patterns if i look into the reality and this is the reality we are facing during an inspection with an ultrasonic probe then both of those effects are actually no effects you will ever see because they do not exist. So this is a little bit of warning on yeah how to how a sound feed looks like. Now you might say, but I'm using a phased array probe. Yeah. Let's look into the sound field of a phased array probe. Here we go. This is a phased array probe, L wave, 2 megahertz, so similar to the one above. We have an elevation of 35 millimeters, a pitch of 1.4 millimeters, 20 elements. Again, here with our 0% bandwidth. And again, we can see all those interference patterns and all those side lobes. But this probe actually has a bandwidth of 70%. So Let's take that into account. And you see, again, all those interference patterns are gone, and all those side lobes are gone or very, very minimal. So you will not see them during your inspection. You might be saying, I use a transverse probe. Let's see. This is a shear wave probe with 2 megahertz. Single element, a size of 20 by 22 millimeters. Again, with a bandwidth of 0%, we see all of those interference patterns, we see all of those side lobes. In reality, with the bandwidth that probe has, yeah, which is 50%, we do not see it. Now you might think of, okay, why do I see all of this information with all the interference pattern and all of the side lobes in a lot of documents. Pretty easy. Back in the days, this information material was issued. Actually, it was very hard to do calculations to show you some kind of a sound field. Back in those days, it was a lot of analytical calculations a lot of calculations by hand. And they were happy that they could provide you with a solution for 0%. Pictures I'm showing you here is modern simulation technologies. And a lot of simulation technologies, still nowadays, they only take into account those 0%. But in reality, we do not have them. We have a bandwidth of about 50%. And so this is something I want to point out to you. This is what we are facing during our real inspections. So now let's get back a little bit to 
our beam spread. This is the reality we are facing. And this is about our sound field, which is getting wider the further we get into our material. We have here, this is our minus 60B beam spread. We have our angle of divergence, which is our half beam spread, and we can calculate that. And in this case, for this kind of a probe, we are coming up to about 3.7 degrees for our 60B angle of divergence. From that, we can calculate how big is our sound bundle at a certain point. It depends on our sound path and it depends on our angle. Now, if we take that formula and look quite at a short sound path, somewhere around where we have our focal point, then we can actually see that we have a pretty small beam diameter, a beam diameter which is actually smaller than the active element we are using. If you look up here, you see, okay, this is between those two lines, this is our beam diameter, and this red line up here, that was our active element. So now, already coming a little bit to the point of the scanning grid, if you want to do an inspection for quite a short sound path, and let's say your specification says, oh, to a 10% probe overlap, this might actually not be sufficient because our, yeah, our sound field can be smaller than our active element. Now, if we go to a larger sound path, for example, if we have a round component, no bore in the middle, and we only inspect with using the second half, yeah, then we are using kind of a long sound path. And we have a pretty wide beam diameter, which can be wider actually than our active element. So depending on your situation, you might have to use a quite tight scanning grid, or a quite real, or you are able actually to go to a more economic solution and use a pretty wide scanning grid. But that is really the topic of the next video. So Thank you for watching. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, feel free to write them down here in the comment section. And next time I will be coming back to the video I promised you last time, to a video about the scanning grid. As usual, you will find more information in the description. I hope you like this video. I hope you give me a thumbs up. I hope you subscribe to this channel. I hope I will see you soon. So thank you for watching. See you soon. Thank you. And bye.